The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, ending Alzheimer's. You can get your cognition back, and that's what counts. What's the plan that can make all the difference? This is the way that people will be treating cognitive decline for years to come. Medical reporter Lori Johnson has the lowdown. I took a cognoscopy, and it was easy. And the living proof. Just do it. It's worth it. Plus... I suffered with it for more than a decade. A carpooling mom gets a miracle. That's healing that for you right now. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. It's, quote, good for peace, good for security, and good for prosperity. That's what Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu proclaimed about the peace deal between Israel and the United Arab Emirates. But listen, there's something about prophecy that I want to talk to you about, and I think it's key. You know, people want to know when is Jesus coming back, when's the second coming, what about the rapture, what about all this stuff? But there's something in Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, 38th chapter, that talks about a war by Gomer, Magog, Tubal, and Iran, Cush, Put, and so forth, that will come against Israel in the latter days. Now, that uh, area uh, came alive with this peace deal because Erdogan in Turkey is saying, I think it's terrible that these people made an agreement with Israel. But what is the significance? Again, here's the key. Ezekiel said Israel is going to be living in the land in peace. It will be in unwalled villages and a coalition led by Turkey and Iran and Rosh, some of the some of the Gomer, some of the uh, area that Gomer. You see, it's mostly in Turkey, but down there in in uh, in Africa, you've got Put, which is Libya and, and Algeria, and you've got Kush, which is the lower Sudan and Ethiopia. Those people are going to come together against Israel in the last days. And that's not the second coming of Christ, but it's something that I think is going to happen. And I think it's going to something we need to be aware of. Now, let's go to Chris Mitchell, who can give us more explanation from Jerusalem. On Sunday, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu saw only good results from the historic agreement. Peace is a good thing, and this peace unites uh, moderate, two of the most advanced economies in the world, Israel and the United Arab Emirates, and two of the most moderate were fighting Iran and the radicals who are trying to overthrow the entire order in the Middle East, subjugate people, propagate terrorism. So this is good for peace, good for security, good for prosperity. Uh, I think it's good for the United States and good for Israel. But not everyone in the region agrees. Iran flat out condemned it. The Palestinian Authority called the UAE traitors, and President Erdogan threatened to break off diplomatic relations with the United Arab Emirates. Exact suspects that you would expect to hate this deal, hate this deal. Best-selling author and Middle East expert Joel Rosenberg tells CBN News Turkey's reaction to the peace deal is revealing. Why is that interesting? Because Turkey has a relationship. They have full normalization with us here in Israel. So the idea that the would-be sultan of Turkey is condemning a Muslim state for creating a full normalization with Israel that he already has, it's ridiculous and it's hypocritical. But it's indicative of the fact that Erdogan is taking his country out of the Western moderate camp into the Iranian Islamist more radical camp. And that's, that's a long-term, very serious problem. Rosenberg also believes this Abraham Accord has prophetic undertones. We watch in the book of Ezekiel, chapters 38, 39, what's known as the eschatological future war of Gog and Magog is the Arab states being very calm and quiet towards Israel. Israel reconstructed, peaceful, prosperous, calm, secure, and then a Russian-Iranian-Turkish alliance forming against Israel. The Bible talks about a confederation of nations, including Put, Kush, Persia, Magog, Gomer, and Tubal coming against Israel. Now, I'm not saying 
The, the war of Gog and Magog is imminent. I'm saying is the trend lines of peace in the Middle East with the Russian, Iranian, Turkish axis, this is exactly where we're heading. This is the trajectory, and it's something that should cause all Christians to watch carefully and to continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. President Erdogan and Iran both have their sights set on Jerusalem. Erdogan said recently he wants to liberate the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and Iran wants to conquer the holy city. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, that's one to watch and it's going to happen, but Erdogan, you know, if you read the book of Revelation and you see the churches of Asia, every one of those things is in modern day Turkey, every single one of them. And uh, so when Paul was talking about going to Asia and so forth, he was going to Turkey. Turkey is, was, was key in, in the biblical prophecy. And now Erdogan, he, he seemed to be okay. He came over here and the president said, well, isn't he a, a fine leader and so forth? But Erdogan has taken over the most important church of the Eastern Orthodox, the Hagia Sophia uh, in Istanbul, and he made it into a mosque, made it into a mosque. Uh, it was, uh, you know, secular, and then, but it was a, it's a Christian organization. And, and Erdogan is now making noises that he might be the leader of another caliphate. He wants to be the caliph. He wants to be the, the new leader of the uh, Muslim people. And Turkey is key in biblical prophecy. So just keep your eyes on that, because I think if, if something is coming up next prophetically, I think Ezekiel 38 is probably it. This is not the second coming of Christ, but it is a, a coalition of people that are, that are focused on Turkey, focused on Iran, and focused on Russia, at least those uh, Muslim states at the, at the um, border of Russia. And they will come against Israel. So the question of how soon, when, but that's coming up next, and just keep, you, you read your paper and it'll be there. Well, to nobody's surprise, in other news, the Democrats pulled out all the stops last night, trashing President Book, uh, Trump in a desperate attempt to gain the White House. John Jessup has more. Pat, former First Lady Michelle Obama was the main act last night, delivering the keynote speech, among other speakers who attracted attention. Eric Phillips has more on the first night of the Democratic National Convention. A number of big names highlighted night one of this virtual convention. Among them, so many average Americans spoke that the common man seemed to take center stage. Still, the night will be remembered by the closing speech from former First Lady Michelle Obama. Donald Trump is the wrong president for our country. He has had more than enough time to prove that he can do the job, but he is clearly in over his head. He cannot meet this moment. He simply cannot be who we need him to be for us. It is what it is. It was a speech meant to appeal to humanity while making the case it's a necessary quality missing from the current Oval Office. Whenever we look to this White House for some leadership or consolation or any semblance of steadiness, what we get instead is chaos, division, and a total and utter lack of empathy. The virtual event was a mix of live and taped segments. We the people. We the people. Including testimonials from citizens like Kristen Orkiza, who lost her father to COVID-19. My dad was a healthy 65-year-old. His only pre-existing condition was trusting Donald Trump, and for that, he paid with his life. There were Republicans and former Republicans who spoke in support of Biden, including one who ran for president himself. In normal times, something like this would probably never happen. But these are not normal times. I've registered as a Democrat for the first time in my life. We are the United States of America. And at each opportunity, the party faithful raked President Trump over the coals for his handling of race relations and the pandemic. Donald Trump didn't create the initial division. The division created Trump. He only made it worse. Nero fiddled while Rome burned. 
Trump golfs. We know that what's going on in this country is just not right. This is not who we want to be. The night opened and closed with prayer, obviously carefully orchestrated to appeal to the faith audience, believed by both sides to be a key demographic in this election. Eric Phillips, CBN News. Thanks, Eric. Pat, the speakers last night pulled no punches. Well, when you think of the Obama administration, uh, he was rivaling Jimmy Carter as one of the worst, if not the worst, president in the history of America. And the failures of the Obama administration are just legendary. And the promises he made and the lies that he made, if you believe, if you like your health care, you can keep it. If you like your doctor, you can keep it. All lies. And you go down a list of things where he promised stuff and it didn't happen. Um, and his incompetence is just appalling. And our trouble around the world was laid to the feet of this man who refused to back up anybody. It's just unbelievable what they have to say. But uh, that's politics. And, you know, in the old days, these conventions uh, were actually uh, exciting because they didn't know who the uh, candidate of the party is going to be. I mean, they had to be uh, vote after vote after vote. The same was true with uh, Franklin Roosevelt. And I think his uh, third term was a question of, uh, was he going to get the nomination? And they weren't sure. And so. Uh, various uh, leaders had to come forward and blocks of vote, and they were trading in the back rooms, and it was exciting. Now the, these conventions are nothing but a showcase for the parties, and the networks are not giving it the same prime time they used to. But uh, this one was pretty sad, and I don't know what Donald Trump's going to do. <laughs> but maybe, maybe the Republicans are going to have something. They were going to Charlotte, and now they're going, we're going to Jacksonville. I'm not sure whether they're going to be able to have any kind of a convention, a virtual or otherwise. Well, I suppose they'll do the same thing that was done last night, and they'll talk about what they've accomplished. Yeah, well, talking about what you've accomplished is one thing. Attacking the other guy is something else. And it was, but I, I remember um, that uh, convention where Ted Kennedy uh, led the people in the chant, where was George, where was George? I mean, it was kind of interesting. And uh, Edward Durston said, well, we're not... Uh, sick. This economy is not sick. We're just, uh, we're not even ill-disposed. We're just badly managed. I mean, it was a great line. And there was a lot of fun in those things, but, you know, no longer. So we'll see what happens. But uh, uh, just prepare yourself for a, a barrage of false information because it's coming down the pike really hard. John? Pat, back here in Washington, the House of Representatives will meet Saturday to vote on a bill limiting changes at the Postal Service. This comes as Postmaster General Louis DeJoy agreed to testify before Senate Committee this Friday and before the House next Monday. Democrats accused DeJoy of working at the president's behest to remove mail sorting equipment and mailboxes in an attempt to suppress mail-in ballots ahead of the November election. Some Republicans are raising concerns that mail-in voting will lead to fraud. Our elections are sacred. Men and women have died for them and the right to vote. And to do this is disgraceful. With respect to universal mail-in voting, it's just like a total catastrophe what's happening. Last week, the Postal Service warned 46 states that mail-in ballots may not arrive in time to count in the election. And Pat, the president, at first opposed more funding to bolster the post office, but has since reversed course. Well, you know, folks, uh, in the old days, uh, I used to go down to the polling place, and I would uh, pick up whatever they had, and I'd give them my name, and they'd check it off the roll. Then I'd go into the little booth, and I would cast my ballot, and then I'd get a little sticker to say I voted, and I'd leave. I don't know why we still can't do that. You know, so sure, COVID is out there, but you can wear a mask and have social distancing, and they can keep people separate. But the, the idea of mailing willy-nilly millions of ballots to people, some of whom are dead, some of them who are not on the rolls, some of them who are, are illegal, to, to do that is a recipe for utter disaster. And the post office can't possibly keep up with it. And furthermore, it, it, will, it will be uh, obviously an opportunity for fraud. I mean, I, I watch 
ABC News, and they say, the president claims without justification. It's always without justification that there's been fraud. There's plenty of justification. Uh, they've, they've found cases right now uh, on the rolls of people who have moved from the state, people who are dead, people, you know, have put in fraudulent claims. And it's obviously easy to vote two or three times and say vote, vote often and, you know, vote early and vote often. I mean, you're not supposed to vote but once. But with these mail-ins, you can put in a ballot, and then you can go personally to the poll, and they, they can, they, they're not going to be able to check all that. I mean, it's going to be unbelievable, the amount of fraud. Why can't people put on their masks, drive to the polling place, and vote personally? We talk about it. We've got to make the post office give them billion. They want to give them five, five billion, I think, dollars to beef up their efforts. And even uh, with that, they won't be enough. So it's going to be a, a, an open door to incredible fraud. And with the counting system they've got, we won't know who the who the out, uh, who the winner is of many many races, including the presidency, for maybe weeks or even months. And that isn't something we want in a democracy, John. Pat, to the coronavirus, COVID-19 is now the third leading cause of death here in the United States after heart disease and cancer. So far, more than 5.4 million Americans have contracted the virus. Nursing home cases are increasing dramatically, up 80% in just a couple of months. Meanwhile, the debate over reopening schools continues to rage. The University of North Carolina Chapel Hill is changing course, canceling in-class instruction after an outbreak on campus. 130 students there coming down with COVID-19. And Pat, this is just one week after fall classes began. I am pleased to report as the chancellor of Regent University that with our staff and with the students, there has not been one single case of COVID-19, not one. And for that, I am just grateful because that's the protection of God. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the region is opening up school and people are coming back and, and everything's all clean and nice and, and safe, but not one case. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? May it, may it stay. Not one. <laughs> may it stay so. Yeah. And, and yeah. Uh, North Carolina State's got some problems. Uh, and the UNC has got some problems. And I think down in Georgia, they've got a number of problems. And many, many schools have uh, been forced to shut. They opened and they shut back down. But as I said yesterday, I, I, I think we we're really uh, in trouble not being able to socialize. I mean, we really miss the idea that you can go out uh, and, and meet with friends, that you can go to a restaurant and have a meal. Or that you can, these students can go to class with one another, and it's going to do terrific damage. We need somehow to open schools, but we cannot open them with the, these mobs of people with no masks all getting together and then catching this terrible disease. Terry? Well, still ahead, a mom waits in a carpool line and receives a healing miracle. How did it happen? Stay tuned to find out. But first, an end to Alzheimer's? Is it even possible? One woman shares her first-hand story and talks about the doctor who helped her right after this. Imagine not recognizing your own spouse or your children and forgetting how to get dressed or feed yourself. Well, that's what happens to one in every 10 people over the age of 65 who are being ravaged by a disease known, it was named after an Austrian doctor, Lois Alzheimer, Alzheimer's disease. And what if the symptoms of this dreaded disease could be reversed or maybe even prevented in the first place? Here's CBN medical reporter Laurie Johnson with that story. Just like a roof with dozens of holes can only work if all of them are repaired, Alzheimer's has dozens of causes that must all be addressed. After 30 years of research, Dr. Dale Bredesen believes the disease can possibly be controlled. Let's make dementia a rare problem. Let's make Alzheimer's a rare disease, just as it should be. His book, The End of Alzheimer's Program, lists the many different causes of Alzheimer's and describes how his Bredesen protocol can make a difference. You can get your cognition back, and that's what counts. 
Sally Weinrich says she experienced a reversal in her Alzheimer's symptoms after starting the protocol nearly four years ago and gives God the glory. From helping me hear about Dr. Bredesen, from the chance to talk to you and share it with others, because I think that's God's wish for all of us to have health, um, and to help me treasure and appreciate my loved ones even more who've been critical and very instrumental in um, my reversing of Alzheimer's. The first step involves getting what's called a cognoscopy. So we recommend that everyone who is 45 years of age or older consider getting a cognoscopy, and especially for anyone who has any Alzheimer's disease or dementia of any sort in their family to get checked out early and get on prevention. A cognoscopy tests for each of the dozens of Alzheimer's risk factors. Because we're all different, we'll each have different results. I took a cognoscopy and it was easy. I just gave blood samples and took a quick online MOCA test. That stands for Montreal Cognitive Assessment and ranges from zero to 30. The blood tests measure your levels of good things like vitamin D, magnesium, and zinc, as well as bad such as toxins and inflammation. Also, your genetic risk. It is a complicated disease. I think there's no one magic bullet. Dr. Rebecca Ryder, who prescribes the Bredesen protocol, ordered my cognoscopy and reviewed my results with me. Most patients will have a combination of things, like they'll have a little bit of hormone deficit, a little bit of blood sugar problems, maybe some concern for a toxin exposure. Based on my individual risk factors, she prescribed a program just for me using diet, exercise, sleep, stress reduction, supplements, and more. We've seen some good reversals of cognitive decline here. I mean, I have seen the patients get better, not all of them. You know, as with anything, the earlier you catch it, the better. Even the people who test positive for one or both copies of the dreaded Alzheimer's gene can benefit from making life changes. We can't control the genes we were dealt with, but there's a whole field called epigenetics, which says how our genes are translated. So those lifestyle factors, your diet, your exercise, all that affects what genes are promoted or not promoted for your health. Now, I'm one of the more than 5,000 people on the Bredesen Protocol. And those 5,000 people, some of them all the way to MOCA scores of zero in late stage. Now, no surprise, the earlier that you get started, the easier it is to get positive outcomes. However, we have seen, seen some people even in late stages with improvement. Dr. Bredesen published 100 documented cases with before and after evidence of improved cognition, including Sally's. Uh, life's good. So no matter what stage you're at, or even if you have what society causes aging problems, um, I'd encourage all your viewers to just do it. Just do it. It's worth it. Meanwhile, the doctor's research continues. We're also, I should say, in the midst of the first trial in history in which instead of predetermining a treatment, say, OK, we're going to treat with this drug or that drug, we're instead looking at all of the different contributors to the cognitive decline for each person and then addressing those. And this is the way of the future. This is the way that people will be treating cognitive decline for years to come. So instead of using a single drug to treat Alzheimer's, it appears a customized, multi-pronged approach could be the best strategy against this scourge. Well, Laurie is here with us now. Laurie, why do you think so many people in this country are getting Alzheimer's? Pat, it's very simple. It's because of our lifestyle choices. We're doing things now that cause Alzheimer's that we didn't used to do in years past. For example, one of the main causes is insulin resistance. That comes from eating too much sugar. Also, inflammation is another huge cause of Alzheimer's. Inflammation comes from eating processed, packaged foods, 
fast foods, those bad oils. Another thing is an unhealthy gut. We've talked about that. That's very prevalent today. Didn't used to be years ago. Another thing is our brain isn't getting the right kind of support, the nutrients that it needs, the right hormone balance and things, you know, even vitamin D is a is lack of vitamin D is a contributor to Alzheimer's. We used to get it from the sun. We're inside all the time now. Another thing is toxins. We see a lot of toxins and chemicals in our foods. Even fresh fruits and vegetables are doused in pesticides and herbicides, the non-organic ones, and those can be toxics. Also air pollution and toxins like mercury in our fillings and in fish and mold exposure can be toxic. Also uh, toxins such as uh, Lyme disease and herpes, those things can really get to your brain and be toxic. And lastly, we're not getting, we're not going uh, 12 hours without food. We're not doing the fasting every day like we used to. We need to go 12 hours minimum with not eating. And so for example, and three of those hours need to be before bed. So for example, you finish eating dinner at seven, you don't eat anything after dinner, go to bed at 10, and then don't eat anything again until seven o'clock the next morning. People used to do that all the time, even more, go more than 12 hours. But now we eat really late at night up until we go to sleep and eat first thing in the morning. That's really bad for your brain. You know, <laughs> what you're saying, the average American must be scared to death when they hear this because everybody is subject. But hey, you had something called a cognoscopy. We've heard about colonoscopy, but this is cognoscopy. And what did it do for you and why should somebody get one? I love how you make the comparison between a cognoscopy and a colonoscopy <laughs> because we all know as Americans, we need to get a colonoscopy when we turn 50. And then the same thing is true for, you know, your, your mammogram and these other screenings. We all know that we're supposed to start getting them at certain ages. You should start getting a cognoscopy at age 45. I got one and it was really easy. Easy. There are three ways to get a cognoscopy, and all three ways are outlined in this new book, which is called The End of Alzheimer's Program. Emphasis on the word program. This book goes on sale today. Don't confuse it with the old book, which is called The End of Alzheimer's. It's good, but it's old. This one has extremely detailed step-by-step -step instructions on how to get a cognoscopy and then what to do about it when you get your results. So there are three ways to get a cognoscopy. The way I did it was I contacted ApolloHealth.com, that's Dr. Bredesen's website, and I put in my zip code and up popped the names of providers who do the Bredesen protocol in my area. 1,500 physicians across the country have been trained in this. You can also go through your own regular doctor, even if he or she has not been trained in the Bredesen protocol. There are instructions about how to go to, to do that. Also, you can just go directly to ApolloHealth.com, and you don't even have to see a doctor face-to-face. -face. Apollo Health can order your blood tests and the cognitive test, and then when you get the results, you compare it to what they should be, and if your results are not within the normal ranges, it tells you how to fix them. Uh, by the way, did you pass? <laughs> did I pass? <laughs> um, okay, um, uh, here's, here's, the, here's the short version. When you start having Alzheimer's, that is, when you start having, you can't remember things, uh, your brain has been deteriorating for 10 or 20 years. It's just like cancer. When you start feeling a lump, that cancer has been growing for a long, long time. And so just like we have screenings to detect cancer early before we even have symptoms, that's what this cognoscopy does. So um, I'm happy to report that um, my brain is still functioning very well. Um, I'm not having any symptoms, but when I took my cognoscopy, I had some very symptoms. And I do believe, Pat, that if I didn't make these changes that I'm now on the program, I do believe that down the road, I would absolutely 100% start having cognitive decline um, if I don't make some changes now. So this is why it's so important to nip it in the bud. You're sharp as a tech, so I, I will not accept the fact that you may have any kind of cognitive retirement. You know, I've, I've got, uh, you know, uh, I take something called Cognitex, and it, it has uh, phosphatidylserine, which is the basis of it, and then uh, it's got something called venpositine, and it's got pregnenolone, and um, a few of these other things, and it, 
It's, if you can pronounce those things, you're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Well, uh, Laurie knows about real fossil tail serine and, and pregnenolone and, and venpositine. But anyhow, that's what I take, and it seems to do some good. Your memory is sharp as a tack. <laughs> well, uh, when I'm talking about the Bible, it's, it's, I'm, I'm on point all the time because the Lord brings that to my mind. Well, folks, the lady, this book is The End of Alzheimer's. It's a program, the first protocol to enhance cognition and reverse decline at any age. If you were, I mean, if this is the, the, the most prevalent disease in America and what it, it's devastating, uh, it's worth getting a book to read about it, it seems like. All right, what you got? Well, coming up, a YouTube favorite, your questions and some honest answers. Virginia says, my church asked us to quit watching the news. Should I find another church? That gives us his take on this and more of your email questions. That's later on. But first, an extreme case of dry mouth that made it difficult even to swallow. How did this mom get healed in an instant after 10 years of suffering? And what in the world did Facebook have to do with it? The answers coming up next. Just imagine waking up every morning with your lips stuck to your gums or living in fear of choking every time you chew your food. Well, that's how Angel Camden lived with extreme dry mouth for 10 long years. Doctors couldn't help her. So how did she get healed in a carpool line? Take a look. My mouth was just extremely dry and I suffered with it for more than a decade. I would wake up in the morning and my lips would literally be stuck to my gums. And I would have to go and just rinse and rinse and rinse with water. I kept water on my nightstand I took a bottle of water with me everywhere I went. I did speak with my physician who suggested that I speak with my dentist and my dentist gave me a few options through the years and I did try things but nothing was really successful. And I just thought that it was something I was going to have to live with. It was stressful when I was eating. I was very concerned that I was going to choke. I would chew very slowly, very small bites, almost like a toddler, and would wash down every bite with a drink of water. I was in the carpool line at my son's school, and I was scrolling through Facebook on my phone, and whenever I see a post from the 700 Club, I always stop and pray along with them. And on this day, Terry was praying. You have yes. like a, an unbelievably dry mouth all the time. It affects the way you're able to eat, the taste of your food. God's healing that for you right now. Your saliva is just going to begin to produce again, and you're going to be back to where you were before. I just started going, oh, my Lord, that's me. That's me. And I prayed along with her. And by the next day, I woke up completely normal. I jumped up and went straight to my knees and said, Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. I was actually saying to him, Lord, I never even thought to pray about this. I just thought it was something, a minor inconvenience that was major to me that I was just going to have to live with and suffer through. And it never even occurred to me to give this to you. And thank you. I just kept saying, thank you, thank you. Praise you, Lord. I now understand that He cares about every teeny tiny detail of our lives. Not just the big things, not just the major things. He loves us, He wants us to be happy, He wants us to be healthy, He wants us to feel good all the time, and everything that bothers us matters to Him. Because He's our dad, there's actually a scripture that says, before you ask, I okay. will answer. Yes. Isn't that amazing? Amazing. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, this is Teresa. She lives in Mount Olive, North Carolina, suffered with an abnormal heartbeat. She described the unnerving discomfort as a flutter, and she learned to live with it for over two years. One day she was watching this program, and she heard you, Pat, pray and call her by name. And you said, put your hand on your chest, and in the name of Jesus, touch. Teresa responded by faith and followed your instructions. The fluttering stopped, and it has not returned. Man, I tell you, 
That, that is a miracle. Believe me, as one who's known some of these uh, things with your heart, that's, that's remarkable. That's God. All right, here's one. Ellen of Latham, New York, suffered from painful bumps under her armpit. She watched this program on July 30th of this year. That was just a few weeks ago, a couple weeks, weeks ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she was, when you were praying, said you've discovered lumps under your armpit. God is healing you, and you won't even need to see a doctor. Ellen, you in her heart, this could be her. Next day, all the bumps were completely gone. Folks, God's no respecter of persons. Let's pray right now. Let's believe God. Nothing's impossible. Terry and I are going to join hands together. Father, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Man, a migraine. Oh, those migraines are killing you. You, you just suffer so much. Is, is it Darnell, Darlene, something like that? The Lord has just healed your, your migraines. In Jesus' name, touch your, your forehead and you are healed. Terry? Yeah, Karen, you have a, a relationship that's very broken with one of your children. You have more than one child, but this one... Uh, there have just been some things that have happened that have really separated your relationship, and your heart is broken over that. God's going to restore that to you. As you have prayed and asked, it is being done in Jesus' name. Receive that word. There's somebody, you, you have what are called night sweats, and it's just wearing you out. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what the problem was, but you are being healed right now. You will not have those things anymore. You will be completely normal. Terry? Someone else, you have a, it's not a stutter exactly, but you have a, an issue with speaking and, and with speaking clearly. God is touching your mouth right now. You're going to know this is you. There's just going to be a warmth in the inner walls of your mouth. Just receive it. Okay. Begin to speak clearly in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. There's an intestinal blockage. You're, it's, it's like your, your intestines are, are looped over and and you, 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 there's a possibility of gangrene. So mm -hmm. right, right now, you've been having a lot of a problem in, in your, uh, your name's Bruce, I believe. And you just touch your stomach right now, and you'll feel the power of God going through, and everything's going to be okay in Jesus' name. Now, Father, in, in your holy name, for everybody watching this program, let your peace, let your power reach out to them, touch them, Lord and bring the blessing of God rest upon them. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. Okay? Okay. Well, still ahead. Think you're not a people person? Think again. Millennial Pastor Chad Beach tells you why you need to sharpen your people skills, and he shows us all how to do it. That's later on today's 700 Club. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. President Trump travels to Iowa today to survey the damage from the storm that destroyed an estimated 10 million acres of crops. Monday, he signed an emergency declaration providing federal funds to help in recovery. Winds exceeding 100 miles an hour destroyed or damaged 8,200 homes and wiped out about a third of the state's cropland. The governor said Iowa suffered nearly $4 billion in damage. The president signed only a portion of the emergency funding request. FEMA is still reviewing the rest. Well, triple-digit forecasts amid a heat wave in California have state leaders closely watching the power grid. If the system gets overwhelmed by electricity demands, more than 3.3 million homes and businesses could lose power at different times with rotating controlled blackouts. Monday, slightly lower temperatures and customer conservation spared the need for shutting off the power. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Work with People. <laughs> That's the title of the latest book by Chad Veach, and it releases today as the pastor of a huge church. Chad interacts with thousands of people, including lots of celebrities. Take a look. Chad Veach is the pastor of Zoe Church in Los Angeles. He's also a husband and a father of four. His diverse church includes people from every walk of life, including celebrities like Justin Bieber, Haley Baldwin, 
Kourtney Kardashian, and Chris Pratt. Pastor Veach believes working with people can be the most challenging and the most rewarding part of life. In his book, Help, I Work With People, Veach shares practical tips on developing your people skills, learning how to influence others, dealing with conflict, and becoming a great leader. Chad, it's great to have you with us today. Well, thank you so much for having me on. It's always a delight to talk to you. Well, the first word in the title of your book is help. Why do we so desperately need help in our interaction with each other? Well, you know, I think the whole premise of the book is pivoting from help I work with people to, you know, having a desire and really a motivation to say, you know, help I work with people. And like the Apostle Paul said, I want to become all things to all people so I can win with them. So it's not like a dreaded help my in-laws or my neighbors or my coworkers, but really the spirit of the book is saying, you know, help, I want to be good with others because I want to lead them to the ultimate destination, which is a relationship with God. And you say that the hardest person you're ever going to have to be in charge of is yourself. So really when you're saying help, it's help me be better myself first, right? You know, the whole thing, thing about the blame game is that I'd love to play it. It just doesn't get me anywhere. So I'd love to blame others and they're the problem and their opinion and their issues. But you know, the common denominator in all my relationships is me. So I've got to get healthy. I've got to get a right perspective and a right premise. I've got to get really comfortable in my own skin and discover the why of my life. And then if I can lead myself, leading others gets really easy. You know, we need to be people persons because we interact with each other every day, but some people are, are shy, some people are extroverts, some people would like to talk but really don't know if they have the, the ability or the right to. How do we become people persons? Well, that is the question. How do we become people persons? Because the reality is no matter what business you're in, even if you're a stay-at-home mom right now during COVID, you're in the people business. You know, All of us have influence. The definition of leadership, leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. They say the average person will influence 70,000 people in their lifetime. That's just the average person. So we have to first realize we are, number one, in the people business. Number two, we're influencing others. And if we're going to get good at this, we've got to determine that people are not the problem. People are who God loves the most. And if that's who God loves the most and who I work with the most, I should spend a little bit of time trying to get good at navigating through life because you can't you can't do life well if you're doing people wrong. So we got to figure this out. If we want to do life well, we got to figure out how to work with work well with others. Well, one of the things you say is that to connect with people, we have to first show them that we care about them. And I think most people would say, well, if how do I do that? Yeah. Well, it first starts with the motivation or the desire to connect with others, trying to find a common ground. You know, we live in this divided culture and a divided nation. And all we're focusing on right now is our differences. But humanity, we have so much in common. So if I want to win with others, I'm not going to do that from, you know, my opinion and, you know, from from my place of life. I've got to really lean in and listen and try and discover where they're coming from and their unique gift mix for them, for their, for their life. So I think we just got to work hard. Connection starts with the desire to connect. Well, because we're so busy sharing our opinions, as you mentioned, there's a lot of conflict in the world today, not just here in the United States, but literally in the world today. But you say in the book that actually conflict can be a good thing. In what way? Well, I always think conflict is an opportunity to prove uh, our commitment to one another, our real connection to each other. I'm never afraid of conflict. Conflict is inevitable. Anybody that's been in a family knows there's conflict. Anybody that's been a part of a church or uh, any job you've had, conflict's that inevitable thing that's going to happen in life. I'm never afraid of conflict. I'm only concerned with the one that doesn't have conflict resolution because we got to resolve. We got to bring, it's kind of like, you know, I grew up in church playing piano and I love that suspended, 
you know, a note that suspended a chord, but it's got to re resolve back to the one so we can continue on with the music. Life is that thing that we got to resolve our issues, resolve. Maybe you've been offended. Maybe you've been betrayed or hurt. You know what? I, I'm not discrediting that, but we've got to get to a place where we can resolve our conflicts and move forward because it's not going to do us any good to hold on to those offenses. You could have written about many topics in this day and age. Why was it important for you to write this specific book at this particular time? Well, I really felt like writing my first leadership book that I wanted to write what I think leadership is all about. I think leadership and life are all about people. Life is about people. If anything that we've learned out of COVID is that it's not about the buildings. It's all about people. People make a place and people make the world go round. So I wanted to write a book to inspire people to, to really pivot from that whole, uh, you know, help. I work with this person and that person and that, you know, this kind of conflict that's in my life to really inspire people to say, no, 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 let's really get our hearts and our minds right. Life is about others, adding value to others, serving others, encouraging and equipping others. And if we can get that down, life is going to get so much better. Encouraging others, we wind up watering our own souls. I want to say Chad's book is called Help. I work with people, and don't we all? I want to say it is a fresh encouragement to how to do that with influence and leadership and doing it effectively. It's being released today. It's available wherever books are sold. Thanks for another good one, Chad. It's great. Always great to see you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bless you. We'll be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Time for your questions and some honest answers. Pat, this first question comes from Virginia, who says, my church asked us to quit watching the news. They call it a news fast. They want us to focus on love and the Great Commission. I believe Christians should watch the news and try to be good citizens. Should I find another church? Uh, absolutely not. I think that pastor's giving you a good advice. <laughs> People can get just bombed out if you watch this news week after week. There's so much hate and so much evil and so much garbage. And as Trump called it, there's so much fake news. So I, I think your pastor's giving you good advice. I wouldn't change churches for the world. Right. This is Shannon who says, how do I pray for my 31-year-old daughter who has two children and is in another ungodly relationship that's damaging to her and her kids? The last two relationships left her with two kids born out of wedlock and left my husband and me with her now 10-year-old son. I have prayed for years, but nothing has changed. What should I pray? Please help. Tired of crying for these babies. You know, the, the Bible says, bring up a child in the way that he shall go, and when he's old, he won't depart from it. I, that daughter must not have had a very good uh, upbringing when she was young. But um, it sounds like, again, uh, there's a certain enablement. You, you, she has these kids. She doesn't take responsibility for them, and they turn out to be yours. And uh, I, I think there comes a time that people have to be confronted with their, their sins. And what you could do, I mean, maybe have the children taken away from her, and you might want to adopt them and make them your own. But uh, I, I think uh, this, this daughter is, is, is bad news, and there needs to be some kind of an intervention. I mean, people got to get with her and say, look, you've got to uh, shape up that this kind of thing of having promiscuous sex, ha getting pregnant, and, and, and leaving your children for your parents to look after. That, that's, you know, Something seriously wrong, okay? Richard wants to know, how do I pray if I'm angry with God? <laughs> what you'd, you'd better do is realize that God, yeah, what you need to do is start reading the Bible. Read what the Bible says about himself. He is the author of everything. You know, how can you get mad with God who gave his own son that he loved you so much? And what you need to do is focus on the love he has and you need to look at yourself. What are you doing wrong? And so God doesn't sin, doesn't solicit the sin. God is absolutely perfect. So 
if, if you question him, uh, what you're really doing is conf confessing yourself that you are angry with yourself and you're blaming God for it. And so what you need to do is look inside and say, well, let me look at me, okay? This is Annette who says, what if you learn your pastor does not believe in the preexistence of Christ? What should you do? Um, what you should do is get out of that church as fast as you can. Yeah. I mean, you, you don't hang around and I think, if he doesn't believe in Jesus, you, you know, this is the spirit of Antichrist. And those that believe in God believe that the Lord came in the flesh. And, and you know, he is the author of everything. And, you know, you are complete in him. And without him, there's no salvation. There's no other name whereby we must be saved except Jesus. So if you've got a pastor that doesn't believe in the power of God, doesn't believe who Jesus is, doesn't believe in the Trinity, uh, you ought to get out and, and don't try to stir up a, re a revolution. Just, just leave. I mean, there are plenty of churches. Find one that preaches the, the gospel. Mm -hmm. Well, today's Power Minute is from Exodus 14. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Now listen, tomorrow we've got the exciting show where you actually have your voicemails with your questions. And it's an extended edition of your questions and honest answers. And it seems to be quite popular. So it's on tomorrow's 700 Club. And I look forward to being with you then. Don't miss it. For Terry and all of us right now, though, thanks for being here. And Lord willing, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.